Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our public lecture today. But before we get started, we respectfully acknowledge that SFU Burnaby is located on ceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And I, Ryan Watmo, am honored to be joining you from Invermere, BC, the shared unceded home of the Squamic, the Kiskanuk, and Tanaha Nation, and the chosen homeland of the Columbia Valley Métis. Since 1989, SFU's Community Economic Development Program has been a leader in bringing about social, ecological, and economic change. Researchers refer to a set of five principles that help differentiate CED from other traditional forms of economic development. And now, accredited by Economic Developers Association of Canada, or EDAC, we are pleased that today, many of those traditional EDOs are moving towards our five principles too. And just last year, SFU CED instructors, Chapelle Montsiam, and Lily Raphael wrote Step Into the River, a framework for economic reconciliation. They propose that the extent to which economic reconciliation can be transformative depends on whether we ourselves are willing to transform. For our economy to shift, we need to rethink what we value, how we relate to one another, and how we make decisions. This framework offers a set of values, fundamental practices, and ideas for action to create an impact and embrace transformation. We invite you to step in the river and be part of this journey after today's public lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce today's SFU CED public lecture presenter, Rob Newell, for his talk titled Interactive Visualizations as Tools for Participatory Planning and Stakeholder Engagement. Dr. Newell is a Canada Research Chair in Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainability at Royal Roads University and a Research Associate at the Food and Agricultural Institute, University of the Fraser Valley. Rob's research focuses on integrated planning and explores the use of systems thinking for supporting local and regional planning and decision making. He develops tools for facilitating more inclusive collaborative approaches to planning, and his research also involves game development software to build realistic visualizations for participatory planning and community engagement. Rob also teaches courses on critical sustainability issues, particularly climate change and biodiversity loss, and approaches to sustainable development. Rob? Thank you very much for joining us today. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, as uh, I mentioned, I'm Rob Newell. I'm uh, the Canada Research Chair in Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainability at Royal Roads University. Uh, this is uh, located in the territory of the Lekwungen and Kusapsa Nations. What we're gonna be talking about today um, is we're look, gonna be looking at the, the use of visualizations, particularly interactive visualizations as noted in uh, my bio uh, that are developed using video game software. The idea of these uh, visualizations is that uh, you can use video game software to create virtual worlds um, that represent the real world environment and use these tools to be able to engage a whole variety of folks, diverse audiences in trying to look at different ways you can develop and manage a place. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to be sharing a few examples that I've done over the years. Um, and as you're going to see, this is a bit of a flexible process. You can apply this, uh, this type of technique to a whole variety of different places and contexts. Before we go any further, um, often when people ask me what I do for my research, um, you know, my research chair title is uh, Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainability, but that's a very broad umbrella. So when people ask me specifically what I do for research, uh, generally my response is integrated planning and policy. Now, what does this mean? Well, the way I describe it is integrated planning policy is using systems perspectives to be able to understand how a certain plan program or strategy fits within a whole variety of social, environmental, and economic factors. Uh, um, for instance, if you were to think about how to uh, develop a trail system, um, the strategy there would be you're developing a trail system so you can increase access to recreation, you can uh, maybe encourage active transportation, reduce uh, vehicle traffic on the road, but you can also take a perspective of saying, how do we integrate this with other objectives such as uh, green space and uh, local biodiversity and habitat? So perhaps maybe we can create a trail system that integrates with um, greenways, uh, green networks and uh, improves ecological connectivity. Um, we can maybe strategically implement it in ways that also creates buffers and protects water areas too, um, our fresh water bodies. 
So with this sort of perspective, um, a lot of what uh, my research ends up doing is creating stuff like this, systems maps, where we can figure out if you're to implement a strategy, what are the outcomes of it? Where can you experience co-benefits, multiple benefits? And also importantly, where are the trade-offs? Uh, they're not all win-win situations. So if we're to do a particular strategy, uh, where might it uh, um, uh, achieve or align with a variety of social, environmental, and economic objectives? And where might you see those tensions? The other thing about integrated planning, uh, myself and many others uh, that work in this space, will argue that you can't do integrated planning without participatory processes. There are two ways of being able to uh, think about this, and those, those ways are captured very well by this quote, where it says governance is more effective if it occurs where the problem is felt or where the opportunity actually appears and in cooperation with those who are affected by it. So you can take this quote in a very practical sense. As I showed in the previous slide, uh, with Integrated planning is about thinking about how different strategies, plans, and programs fit within a whole constellation of social, environmental, and economic factors. So with that in mind, it makes sense. It is just practical to uh, invite and engage people that have experience with those different social, environmental, and economic factors, whether this is professional or lived experience. So that's sort of a practical perspective. Another way of being able to take this quote uh, is more principled in nature, where people have a right to have a say in how places of value, how home places, home territories, uh, home areas, how these uh, places develop and how they're managed. Another thing that I want to mention is that uh, when doing this visualization work, um, I've developed uh, some theory around it that regards these things as place-based tools, meaning that the value of these realistic visualizations is they engage our sense of place. They interact with our place-based values, meaning this, well, this referring to the collection of meanings, values, attitudes, beliefs, uh, emotions, identities that we associate with a particular place or locality. Now, I started thinking about this um, by looking at this relatively old study here that uh, was done by Lewis and Shepard, who were both part of UBC at the time. Uh, they uh, did a series of scenarios, or they looked at a series of scenarios, uh, forestry scenarios on Mount Chiam, um, which is um, uh, a place that uh, is uh, east of Vancouver, uh, about, let's say, maybe 60 kilometers or, 60 kilometers, uh, kilometers or so um, up the valley there. And they engaged uh, folks, uh, community members of GM First Nations to um, see, hey, what do you think about these different ways of depicting the scenarios? Uh, do you like these, uh, these sort of images? Are they useful tools for thinking about how to do uh, forestry on, uh, on the mountain here? And the two sets of images they showed were uh, map-based images showing um, no uh, uh, forestry done at all, no logging done at all. So doing a sort of a partial cut block thing and then doing full clear cutting. And then they showed a set of images that were realistic visuals, uh, static images from a particular point um, in the uh, the area where a lot of community members were familiar with and often will go to to view the mountain. So this was a familiar uh, viewpoint that they were looking at. And between the two images, there is this general sort of agreement that, yeah, maps are useful. Maps have a place. There's a, this is a, a useful tool for thinking about how to do planning and management. But the realistic visualizations particularly resonated with the group. Um, they made reference to the fact that, you know, looking at this gives you a sense of how a scenario might uh, not just look, but also feel like in the real world, right? So this kind of gives you uh, these, this reference to how it might feel, sort of um, uh, what it indicates is this reflective of the fact that these visualizations are engaging with people's place-based values. They're engaging with people's sense of place, that you're looking and engaging with a scenario um, based on not just um, sort of more quantitative metrics um, and what might be good or bad about it, but also uh, things that are less tangible, um, things like the feelings you might have around and emotions. So things that it might be hard to articulate, but are still important in terms of thinking about uh, how you might want to develop and manage a place. So with that in mind, with that, uh, that background context, I am now going to give you a few examples of some projects that have done that involves uh, realistic visualizations. The first one is done in Sydney Spit Park. This is a park that was, it's at the uh, northern uh, portion of Sydney Island, which is about four kilometers east of uh, Sydney, uh, the town of Sydney, which is in the greater Victoria area. 
This project, um, this was the first time that I was working with these interactive visualizations. So this project, um, even though it was centered on a park and done in the park's context, it was also, um, uh, there was a broader research uh, question that was being explored here. And this was around, how do we take this uh, visualization technology, those visualization techniques, and bring them into the coastal context? Um, up until that point, most of the work had been done more in the terrestrial context, uh, consisting of static images, that sort of thing. And there's been there was far less work done in the coastal context. So we're saying um, here, or what we're looking at here was, how do we use this visualization technology to stimulate more participatory approaches, more engagement in integrated coastal management uh, and planning? Now, um, in order to get a sense of this, uh, well, we first kind of had to figure out, well, what is needed for a visualization that is applied in the coastal context, something that could support integrated coastal management and planning. And in order to think about that, what uh, we uh, did was look at the types of people that might show up to the table in a collaborative or um, uh, planning uh, session or an engagement session around coastal management and planning. And to do this, we used a cult uh, cultural models framework. So this was uh, something that was developed um, by a researcher named Thompson back in 2007. So it's fairly old and it's not exhaustive of all the cultural models out there. But what it does is it loosely describes different types of relationships people have with coastal places um, and uh, it describes this like with respect to like coastal property or our coastal, coastal spaces. And just to give you a bit of a rapid fire of what each of these are, the, the landscape model is about people that, uh, that view coastal places for that seascape view. The sovereignty model is um, for about uh, people that kind of view coastal places with respect to their own private coastal property. Moral order refers to a model where people look at coastal places and look at them as very awe-inspiring uh, uh, spaces that are a testament to a higher power. Uh, ecological um, refers to people that uh, think about coastal Coastal places with respect to the ecosystem interactions that occur there, both land and sea. Uh, community looks at coastal places with respect to these being spaces for social interactive interaction and social activities. Uh, productivity looks at coastal spaces, uh, places with respect to uh, the resources that these places provide. And commodity has a focus on coastal places with respect to uh, the property values there. And there's often fairly high property values in these sort of coastal areas. So those are the different uh, cultural models that were identified by Thompson. They're not exhaustive and they're not mutually exclusive. People can have pieces of one or the other, but it just gives you a bit of a, a sense of the different types of perspectives and relationships people can have with place. And with this uh, framework, I did a review-based study to kind of think about then how would people conceptualize these places? How would they mentally imagine them? And with this understanding of how they would mentally imagine them, what's important for a visualization in order to be able to be able to speak to these variety of different people, um, in order to be able to allow them to engage with different scenarios, uh, find areas, see areas that might be in some, some of their blind spots, make sure that uh, they can in, engage and see sites that are important to them. Some of the things that really came out of this, uh, this research is what we found was that uh, we needed a visualization that allowed people to explore the view shed from multiple examples, because, or sorry, from multiple angles, because uh, views, seascape views seem to be a fairly important part of uh, at least a couple of these cultural models. And the other thing was that we found was that there's a lot of blind spots within, with respect to the underwater areas, right? So people often think about uh, coastal places where they mentally imagine them, um, which makes sense. Uh, they think about them in terms of terrestrial spaces, but in order to do integrated coastal management, you have to think about them in terms of uh, interconnected land and sea domains which means that we needed a visualization that wasn't static, something that people could walk around, something that allows people to cross the land-sea interface, something that also allows them to explore the view shed from multiple angles to see how certain development or management scenarios might impact it from various perspectives. In order to do this, uh, we used a software called Unity 3D. Uh, this is video game development software. And this is where we end up developing the virtual environment um, with all the dynamic elements in it. It is a uh, visualization that's supposed to represent real world places. So we start uh, with GIS software. So this is um, uh, where we organize our spatial data, um, create maps, uh, and then we take those maps 
uh, arrange them in Photoshop, add some textures on them, and then uh, plot them into Unity 3D to guide the uh, placement of different objects and elements in the visualization. So that's that's kind of the general workflow that uh, that happens within these uh, visualization development processes. Now, I'm not going to go into too uh, many of the details around how to develop the visualization, but I'll just give you like a sense of the, the types of things that happen here. The very first thing that needs to be done is that you need to create terrain for people to walk around. And generally, there's two different types of terrain that I've identified that are important for this. There is this uh, navigable terrain, um, the, the smaller segments that people can walk around. They're smaller segments because you need a high degree of detail on them. Uh, so uh, people can walk around and see uh, different things like surface textures and objects from this first person perspective. They're going to be right next to these elements. So there needs to be this high degree of detail. And then you have a view shed terrain, a uh, terrain that uh, exists outside of these navigable, navigable segments that people can't walk on, uh, but serve as uh, part of the, the background views as uh, people walk around uh, that form that view shed. Then, and you see in the, the top right hand corner here, um, one of the next major steps is then trying to map the different elements that you will see in a visualization. This can be done through field work. Um, it could also be done by collecting uh, current spatial data that's already available. Um, and ultimately what happens is you arrange these maps in a GIS program, uh, bring them um, through that workflow that I, was, uh, that I showed you, bring them through into the gaming engine environment. You plot them onto terrain surfaces, and this allows you to uh, put different objects in the places that they would appear in the real world. So they're spatially relative to one another, um, and it represents a real world uh, place and space in that respect. It's very easy to do for static objects, things that don't move, but you have to kind of think about different approaches for dynamic objects. And that includes things like where people are, um, where they generally walk, where you see things like gulls, uh, boats, uh, how, how much boat traffic do you generally see around Sydney Spit. So there are you know, multiple different uh, methods for a lot of these dynamic uh, objects. And often you, um, well, at least I found that I needed to come up with a method uh, depending on what the, the object was. The final piece I want to talk about uh, before we, we move on um, is uh, the the, the uh, Sydney Spit visualization also included a soundscape. So this is what you're looking at in the bottom right hand corner. What you're looking at uh, are these these boxes uh, that um, trigger sounds as you walk up to different objects. In this particular case, if you walk up to this person, they will say hello to you uh, and the dog will bark. So you have these sounds that um, allow people to engage in the visualization uh, in through multiple senses. And uh, you also have ambient sounds like the sounds of waves, uh, have sounds that are uh, associated to location so that they're, uh, you can experience them in 3D, like sounds of boats and gulls. Uh, they get louder the closer you get. The important um, element to, or the important aspect to highlight here is we add a soundscape because people do engage in scenarios. They assess whether they like certain development or management uh, options based on um, multiple senses, not just the visual of it, but they also want to be able to assess these scenarios based on uh, certain sound things, whether there's things like noise pollution. And I'll, um, I'll be able to speak to that a little bit later. So. With that said, um, I think it'd be worthwhile just to show you a video of how this Sydney Spit visualization looks. So this is a user that is at the home screen. In this particular case, they are clicking H. They're going uh, for a high tide scenario. So they're going to explore the visualization through uh, as, as it would be at high tide. This is a, currently what you're seeing right here is that that was the visitor's area. Now they move beyond the visitor area and they're just walking up the spit. It's just walking through water, it makes the splashing sounds, you know, just to give it a sense that it's a real world place. As mentioning, people need to be able to walk across the land sea interface, be able to understand these as interconnected domains. We're looking at eelgrass meadows. So there's a lot of eelgrass around there and the eelgrass meadows form important habitat uh, for things like Dungeness crabs. You might've noticed a Dungeness crab there. And as we're walking by people, hello. they hit, say hello. 
so that person just said hello, um, which is not just me being cute about the visualization. It's uh, as we saw in that um, the previous slides, there are certain cultural models or certain perspectives of coastal places as important places for social gathering. So that's the reason why we add those elements to show that the, there is a level of social interaction that happens in these places. So after creating the model, the base model, the next step is then to create some scenarios um, in order to figure out what scenarios uh, might be relevant in order to create a tool that was actually useful and not just something that was interesting as far as a research project, um, engage to Parks Canada to ask, what are the current issues, uh, the management environmental issues that you're experiencing in the park? And what sort of scenarios could we possibly explore um, that would be interesting to look at from a collaborative management and planning sense. The uh, the scenarios that we came up with were fancy scenarios. So Parks Canada had plans and uh, these plans have now been done uh, to remove a bunch of scotch broom that was at the north end of Sydney Spit and then fence the area around it so that they could allow uh, the native vegetation to restore uh, and just uh, uh, reestablish in the area. So in the fencing scenarios, what, what we experimented with here are different configurations of the fence. Uh, they're in different spatial configurations, different styles of fence. So uh, wood, mesh, and a, a rope fence that's you know, not really a fence, but an indication that you shouldn't go in there. Um, and then we also had signs, uh, the do not enter signs, and we experimented people could toggle on different locations of where that sign will be located. And then the second set of scenarios were around mooring boys. So in Sydney Spit, people are allowed to uh, uh, boat up to Sydney Spit, and there's a bunch of mooring boys where they can attach their boat. Um, if they uh, people attach their boat to a mooring boy, there's no issues experienced. But what happens is when all the mooring boys are taken up and more boats come in, uh, boats will come up next to other boats and they'll drop their anchor. And that's problematic because, as we saw before, there's eelgrass meadows there and there's concerns about damages to these meadows. So uh, in this scenario, what we're looking at was that uh, we have the current situation where the mooring boys are, or we can move them back outside of the eelgrass meadows and set up some sign boys, uh, signage boys that say, do not uh, go past this, boy, uh, this point, do not uh, moor past this point. And then the final set of scenarios around dog management. Um, dog management is a big issue in all parks. Uh, Sydney Spit has a rule where you can uh, bring your dogs, but you have to keep them on their leash at all times. Otherwise, they bother birds and other wildlife. Um, but as you can imagine, and as seen in other parks, people often don't follow that rule. So we have a current situation where uh, half the people in the park uh, that have dogs um, have them on leashes, um, whereas others uh, do not. And then uh, the other scenarios are no dogs in the park and then one that was more of an increased enforcement and awareness. Uh, so we have people in the park asking people to keep the dog on the leash and a sign saying uh, um, when you come into the visitor area, keep the dog on, on leashes. So these are relatively modest scenarios, but uh, it, uh, it made they were um, really uh, very much relevant to the current concerns um, at, uh, at Sydney Spit. Uh, so we wanted to make it as um, as realistic and relevant to real world issues as possible. So let's just take a look at these scenarios. This is the fencing scenario. So that's the wood fence. This is the mesh fence style. And then that's the rope fence style. And as you'll see in a moment, you can have different configurations of the fence and you can also move the sign around too. So now with the mooring boy scenarios, you can experience these scenarios from on land. So this is what the view shed looks like currently. And this is it with the boats moved backwards or, or outside of the eelgrass meadows. And then you can experience it from boats because the boats are a big user group or boaters are a big user group. It's an easy fit. You can also jump on this uh, ship to shore dinghy uh, to get a sense of how long it takes in both scenarios uh, for, for you to get into land. And here's our dog scenario. So this is a naughty dog bothering the birds. This is actually based on real world observations. I didn't just arbitrarily choose that point. There was a dog bothering birds out there. So that uh, we saw with no uh, dogs there. And now this is the increased uh, enforcement awareness scenario. This is a Parks Canada person. Uh, we don't have professional voice actors, but that's a, you can sort of hear a Parks Canada version, uh, person like mumbling, please keep your dog on a leash. This is a different part of Sydney Spit, the visualization. Um, and we also decided 
you know, have a- Thanks for keeping your dog on a leash. Have a little bit of positive reinforcement for those folks that were actually uh, uh, keeping dogs on leashes. So those are the, that's the Sydney Spit visualization of the scenarios in a nutshell. Um, in order to kind of test its ability to engage uh, folks in um, collaborative park management and uh, management planning, um, what we did here was uh, uh, invited, invite a whole bunch of people in um, the uh, greater Victoria area, particularly people that live like near Sydney's, uh, Sydney, um, uh, those folks that uh, might have more access to Sydney Spit or might be more aware of it. So we got about um, close to 30 people uh, show up for some of these focus groups and we got them to engage with the visualization and ask them questions, uh, A, about uh, their scenario preferences and B, how useful the visualization was for making decisions around those scenario preferences. And these are the insights that we got out of it. Um, well, at least some of them, I'll share, you, share some of the, the particularly interesting ones. For the fencing scenarios, what we found was that the visualization was very, very useful for fencing. And in particular, it allowed people to think about fences uh, with respect to two things, functionality and aesthetics. And what was particularly interesting about this was that uh, people looked at those as trade-offs. A lot of folks really liked the, uh, the look of the wooden fence, but felt it wasn't a real fence. People thought the mesh fence was pretty ugly, but was actually the only real fence, uh, real barrier um, that would prevent people from walking into these uh, these restoration areas. And also people saw the dogs running around and thinking like, okay, well, perhaps maybe we need to forego the aesthetics and actually get a real barrier up. Now, what was really interesting about this aspect of, or this set of scenarios was that people also provided feedback on the wording of the sign uh, or the design of the sign in particular. What people found was that they really didn't like the, the look of the sign. They didn't really like the message that it was uh, expressing. Some people even thought, or actually referred to it as big brotherish, right? Uh, they thought it was just uninviting in terms of uh, trying to get people to collaborate um, or trying to get people to get to participate um, in uh, conservation efforts. They didn't like this, the fact that it just said, do not enter in uh, red block letters. And instead they made suggestions around, could we have something that's more around interpretive signage or have more of a interpretive signage approach that talks about the restoration efforts, uh, something that allows for public education and awareness. Now, what's interesting about this insight was that this wasn't part of the scenario assessment, or at least wasn't part of the scenario assessment that I uh, that I, I asked folks about. It wasn't a thing that I asked them to assess, but when you model things to this level of detail and realism, what you're actually doing is you're opening up new opportunities for people to assess parts of uh, the scenario, assess, assess aspects of the scenarios that you didn't initially intend for them to do. Now in the uh, Mooring Boy scenarios, uh, a couple of interesting insights from here. The ability for people to explore the underwater environment allowed them uh, to appreciate the, um, uh, the fact that there needs to be eelgrass protection and gave them a greater appreciation for why we would uh, move the mooring boys back. That was uh, an interesting and also a heartening finding. So it expanded people's uh, vision and conceptualization of coastal places. The other thing was that uh, the this is I was mentioning this before. Uh, in this scenario, people uh, found that the sound really contributed to their ability to assess whether they liked or didn't like a scenario. So some folks like the idea of the um, uh, boats being moved back to protect the eelgrass meadows, but they didn't like how much longer it took for this, the ship to shore uh, dinghy to, uh, that travel. How much longer it took for that travel to take because um, in that sort of uh, sense, as you might remember uh, from the video. The uh, the ship the, the the dinghy makes noise, and they were concerned about the increased noise pollution. So I think it was uh, about a minute or so in the current scenario, but it took about two minutes and twenty seconds for them to get to shore in the uh, the secondary scenario, the second one where the mooring boys are moved back. The final piece around dog management, uh, what we found was that there was mixed feedback on the usefulness of the visualization. A lot of people have pretty locked in opinions on whether they like dogs in parks, but also it was the least spatial of the uh, the scenarios. Um, it was one that was really could happen anywhere in the park. So it kind of goes to show that these visualizations do actually have some value for uh, assessing spatial features as well as uh, place-based features. Then 
The other thing that I, uh, we found, and this was quite interesting, was that we used the visualization in some of the focus groups to explore alternatives. So we could say, like, let's look at a perhaps maybe where an appropriate off-leash area would be. And that's really cool. So what we're looking at here is the ability to be able to navigate in the virtual environment, have that free movement, allows people to suggest other options. Uh, it doesn't constrain them um, in terms of uh, their feedback on the types of uh, scenarios they'd like to see and uh, the types of scenarios they like or don't like. They can provide um, uh, alternatives and other suggestions. So that's the first project. And now we're going to move to a, a very different context. Uh, we did a, did a visualization project um, called Spaces, Places, and Possibilities in the uh, the city of Squamish, which for the folks that aren't familiar with Squamish, is about 50 kilometers north of Vancouver. Uh, Squamish has got a population of, uh, well, at the time of the project, which was uh, a few years ago, it got, had a population of about 20,000 people. The project was uh, uh, took a community-based participatory research approach um, where engaged uh, local government and stakeholders to figure out what their local planning concerns are and uh, needs are for thinking about how to plan and develop um, in the future. Squamish of uh, for people that can visit it, it's a beautiful town. It's located uh, within a valley area. So you have these, these beautiful mountainscape views and um, it's a lot of uh, outdoor recreation opportunities there too. The project um, was done in three phases. The first phase involved engaging folks, as I was mentioning, local government and uh, um, community stakeholders in the development of a systems model. So this is, um, taking that systems mapping approach that I was talking about at the beginning of this presentation. So we create a, uh, uh, a map of uh, different strategies and um, possible outcomes for these strategies. And we use this uh, to as a lens for being able to understand um, if we were to develop in one way or another, what does it mean for a variety of social, environmental, and economic outcomes? And um, so that latter part, the development one way or another, we uh, um, define those through what we refer to as development scenarios. So these are storylines in which uh, um, define how uh, Squamish can develop and what it could look like in the future. Then phase two involved a integrated modeling and analysis of community scenarios. So this was done mostly using um, uh, ArcGIS and R statistical software. And the idea was uh, we use a systems map as a guide to uh, do a bunch of calculations, um, a bunch of analysis of the scenarios, to understand uh, you know, what are the, uh, the different sort of outputs or outcomes based on a whole variety of indicators uh, if we were to develop in one way or another. Phase three involved creating communication tools. So phase two was useful for getting some insight on the implications of developing one way or another, but it was a lot of data. It, it was very, very complicated, complex set of data. Um, we're looking at something like 350 lines of data. So we created these communication tools, uh, namely a visualization, uh, as you can imagine, that's the topic of the conversation here, and a model explorer, a way of packaging uh, the model outcomes in, in uh, ways that people can look at them and engage with the different outcomes and the different aspects of the model. And I'll show you both of these in a moment here. So let's just talk about phase one. How was uh, this model developed uh, in collaboration with the community? Well, it involved two focus groups. The first one was a bit of a scoping session. Um, that's probably the best way of putting it, where uh, we engaged folks at uh, the, the district of Squamish, so the, particularly the planning department, to get some rough ideas of what community development scenarios could be. And uh, by, by that, it's this idea of like, what would be realistically uh, done here? What's a... Uh, um, currently involved in the plans in terms of different development paths and trajectories. We also wanted to get a sense of which neighborhoods would be useful for applying these scenarios so that we could do this in the, uh, the GIS modeling work. And then uh, we had a broader focus group that was more in depth, and this is where we really sort of fleshed out the elements of the systems model and community scenarios. So this one involves folks from community associations, NGOs, local government as well, um, but also folks uh, from uh, the uh, private sector too. So we got some folks uh, from the uh, development community that were in there. And ask these questions, uh, do the scenarios represent possible future conditions for Squamish? So these like initial ideas, are these worthwhile to explore? What other scenarios would you like to explore? What's a desirable future for Squamish? So this is where we started really developing our storylines for the scenarios. And then what are the key questions that emerge when exploring a community scenario? And what are the major challenges faced by Squamish? The thing I really want to highlight here is that I didn't ask them point blank, 
hey, what do you want to see in a uh, bunch of community development scenarios? And what do you want to see in a systems model? Those sort of questions don't really resonate, though they don't make too much sense to people that don't necessarily work in this sort of research area. Um, so in, instead, you ask questions such as, you know, or use terminology such as what are possible futures for Squamish? What's a desirable future? What are the challenges you're experiencing here? What are key questions? What are the things that you value and you want to uh, see maintained as we move forward? And then the, the data that comes out of there is uh, qualitative discussion data that you can bring into qualitative data analysis software. And through some creative coding, you can create things like these. Uh, community development scenario storylines and a community systems model. So this is a uh, you identify this and tease this out of the the discussions you have there. Now the uh, community development scenarios, um, just briefly, uh, I'm going to describe them as low, medium, high density scenarios. But the storylines are richer than that. That's just sort of the shorthand of them. So we had uh, ultimately through a couple uh, workshops and processes, we whittled things down, and these are the the storylines that we ended up exploring. Now, I'm going to talk briefly about phase two. I'm not going to go into too much depth about it, uh, uh, but I think it's worthwhile at least to touch upon. So phase two involves the quantitative modeling piece where um, we use that systems map to um, guide our modeling process. The, the systems map, there's two major things that the, the community um, really wanted to focus on in the, uh, the systems model. One is that Squamish is experiencing really rapid population growth. At the time, as I was mentioning, it was about 20,000 people, and they projected in under 20 years, it could be up to about 34,000 people. That's that's a lot of population growth, and that's just a medium growth projection. Um, and the other the big major consideration is that's a lot of population growth in a uh, place that's in a valley area that has limited places to expand to. So there's these concerns about how do we use residential space, commercial space, agricultural space, green space, how do we develop uh, all of, in uh, the community with these different land uses and um, and considerations in ways that provide uh, this this new population places to live, work, and play, and also incorporate things like uh, um, ecological values, uh, um, a variety of social values, and economic values. In order to do this modeling, um, what we did was uh, we assumed that uh, we're going to follow that medium growth trajectory and we targeted a future population of 34,000. We started then with a baseline scenario where we mapped out like a lot of things. Um, this is talking about residential, commercial spaces, amenities, schools, uh, parks, uh, agricultural land, a whole variety of things based on uh, the, the systems model that we developed through the, the initial phase. Right, so we mapped out a, a ton of things. This is the current conditions of Squamish. And then we added a few uh, added uh, um, elements to make a future baseline scenario. So the future baseline scenario looked at all the approved development that was there. And um, the with approved development, uh, this allowed us to get a sense of this is what it's going to look like in the future. We still have a certain amount of population that needs spaces to live, need places to live. So how can we distribute this population in various ways uh, based on the, the three storylines that we wanted to explore. So that's sort of how it worked. We created a baseline um, of the current conditions, a baseline of what things would look like in the future. And then uh, we sort of did a bit of a SimCity thing where we just kind of uh, ended up doing different configurations and mapping out different land uh, uh, space and land uses based on these uh, sort of um, these, these storylines that we developed. And I have a video here of the Squamish Model Explorer, but I thought it might be just more interesting to just jump in there and show you it. So uh, as I was mentioning, there's two communication tools that were developed out of this, uh, this project. One of them was just a way of packaging the, uh, the outcomes, the, the uh, considerations in the, the, the scenario or the integrated model and the outcomes there. And this is something that's online. It's available. Anyone can access this. So it's just something that is developed in HTML5. It's just an interactive online piece. As you can see here, I've just entered the Model Explorer. Um, there's three sections. You can learn about the model. Uh, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because this is something that we've just chatted about. Uh, in this learning about the model, you can learn about the different scenario storylines. It also talks about how the uh, systems model was developed and what's in here. It talks about the uh, the mapping of the different baselines. And then it talks about mapping the modeling of the scenarios based on this medium growth trajectory. 
The other element of this, the other aspect of this is that you can explore different maps. Um, how do these things look like if they were implemented in the real world environment? So you can go into the different neighborhoods and take a look at these maps. And this is uh, what redevelopment might look like under these different scenario storylines. And the final section is the actual systems model itself, like the, the main substance of the whole model. Um, where you can scroll over these different elements. You can see the linkages between the different elements, how this uh, system model works. And then you can go into um, any one of these, these pieces here. So I'm going to go into maybe access to amenities. And as you can see, when you uh, go in here, it gives you a description of what the indicator was, how it was calculated. And you can scroll over to see some data um, on, uh, behind the graphs here. So this is basically how you engage with the, uh, the, the model explorer. Now, importantly, I want to I want to mention something to you. In uh, um, most of these elements here, you'll see a link to Squamish indicators. So when you click this, it actually opens up the Squamish community performance indicators, and it uh, scrolls down to to work that they're looking, stuff that they're tracking here. Now, the reason why this is important is because we really wanted to make this research project relevant to the things that they care about. We wanted to make it useful to them. So this element shows that, say, hey, this model isn't, isn't just for fun. These are things that you're actually tracking. These are things that you're looking at as part of your official community plan. So I wanted to highlight that piece there. Now, um, the, the next part of it was creating uh, the scenario visualization. Now, in the uh, the mapping part of things, because we've already done the the mapping, um, we already had these maps, like I was mentioning before, the that workflow where you use object maps to create the 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 visualizations in the video games uh, environment. We already had these maps to work with, and basically we took the maps that we used in the integrated modeling process and brought them over into the video game uh, video game environment and use it to guide where we put objects and different elements to create these scenarios. And I will just now show you what this looks like. Once again, I do have a video here, but I thought it might be just more interesting to look at it in action. And just give me one moment here. So I just turned up the volume on it. I had it muted because there's bird chirps. Otherwise, I could be quite distracting. So I'm just entering one of the neighborhoods. There's two neighborhoods that are featured in this visualization. As you can see, you enter the neighborhood and you can walk around in it. Um, the uh, you got a 360 uh, uh, degree view of everything here. You can toggle on, this is the baseline right now. This is the current conditions, but you can toggle on the different scenarios. This is our low density scenario. It's not a no change scenario. It just means that we keep that low density residential form. This was part of the medium density scenario. And this is our higher density scenario that adds more commercial uh, space. And uh, you, as you can see there, there's a bunch of buildings that have apartments on top and uh, commercial bottom floor. The other elements of this, uh, or the other features that you see in this visualization include things like this. So you do have a map view to be able to orient yourself. Uh, you can teleport to different points to be able to shortcut things It actually you know, it could be relatively slow walking around in these visualization environments. So, um, and uh, as you can see here in these scenarios, the, the storylines were a bit more ri uh, rich than just low, medium, and high density. So we did have to add uh, things like pedestrian pathways in some of these higher density scenarios. And then the other uh, aspects about it was uh, through a series of focus groups, uh, workshops, um, what we found was that people were interested in not just having uh, just the visualization, but they also wanted to have elements of the greater model too. So you can toggle on things like this, the maps that show um, how the different scenarios uh, lead to different um, development patterns throughout the entire community. And they have access to some of the indicators as well too, or uh, some of the outputs of the, the quantitative modeling process. And finally, there were some feedback points that were important but just didn't really fit within the quantitative model um, or the visualization. And we just really wanted to make sure that people had access to this information or these insights. And uh, 
So we added this, uh, you know, feedback window that uh, brought some other considerations, allowed people to have some richer, um, a richer understanding of the implications of developing in one way or another. So that is the visualization there. And I'm just going to quit that one. And just give me a moment while I move back here. So after this was done, um, after this, uh, or towards the end of the project, um, uh, or I should mention at first that uh, through the different phases of the project, we had those workshops throughout. So the visualization and the models were developed through an iterative process where we showed uh, folks um, some you know, initial findings around the models and initial versions of the visualization, took some feedback, uh, made improvements, refinements, and tweaks on them. And then the final piece of this was to open it up to the public. We had an open house event where people could engage with both the model explorer and the visualization to uh, let us know what they think about A, the scenarios, and B, uh, how useful these two tools are about thinking about these scenarios, right? So a very similar approach to what we use in the Sydney Spit visualization project. A lot of insights came out of it, um, but here are just some key points that I thought would be interesting to share. The um, uh, a lot of folks found that the model explorer and visualization were not substitutes for one another. They could be used as complementary tools. They do different things. They allow people to engage in the scenarios in different ways. So this is why, as you're going to notice, that um, uh, one of the things that we started to do was adding more of the quantitative model features into the visualization platform. And in my, my current work and future work, I'm moving towards more integrated tools, a one-stop shop, so you can see everything and engage with uh, all the aspects of the models and um, scenario visualizations. The uh, other piece that came up was that some folks talked about how these visualizations were useful for thinking about the livability of different community futures, uh, so to speak. This was really interesting and important insight because this term livability, um, it kind of refers to sort of fuzzier um, aspects of uh, what people like about places. It's hard to define. It's sort of things like well-being. They're, they're hard things to really pinpoint exactly what you're talking about. So the visualization was good for engaging people in that sense. Uh, once again, it's sort of reflective of the fact that it can connect with people's sense of place and allows people to um, uh, figure out, um, you know, not just the quantitative metrics, like does this increase walkability, uh, how much employment does this add, but also do I like this, uh, like do I viscerally respond to this in a, in a good way. Um, other points that came up was people talked about the uh, the complementary tool set illuminating the trade-offs and different ways Squamish can develop. So a lot of folks really like the metrics that came out of high density um, from the, the integrated model, but they found from the visualization, they're like, well, I don't really like it in terms of a place to live. So um, there seemed to be a lot of people moving towards the middle medium density scenario as a, as a sort of a compromise scenario. And the final piece was that people found that uh, these tools were useful, um, particularly the visualization for understanding the limitations and opportunities with space and land use. So this uh, speaks to an earlier point about the fact that these visualizations are useful for assessing things through a spatial perspective as well as place space. So we're getting uh, close to the end here. This is um, uh, a shorter uh, piece of the presentation, but I do want to share with some more recent work that's been done. Or if uh, come to the just recently come to the end of this project, there's a visualization done around uh, on Middle Nash Island, which is a small BC Park island located about uh, 20 kilometers east of Campbell River. It's only accessible by water taxi, so not very many people uh, visit it. It doesn't really have much in the way of um, pedestrian traffic and uh, visitor traffic. For this one, we started realizing that there's just a lot of features that you can put into these visualizations. When you're using video game software, we're pretty much just scratching the surface at uh, what this, the software can do. So we wanted to experiment a little bit and say like, why don't we create a visualization as a starting point um, like that just has a whole bunch of features in it and then ask folks, hey, what sort of features do you want to see in a future visualization? Where do you want to take it next? What should we focus this on with respect to management scenarios? So trying to keep things a little bit more open. Uh, the folks that we engage were people that um, work on Middle Natch Island uh, and have relationships with it. So this involved uh, um, a BC Parks, First Nation, a local First Nation uh, community and community members there, and uh, Middle Natch Island stewardship uh, team, the MIST team. And uh, we started off with this first version of the visualization that had uh, a lot of different features and um, then had a discussion afterwards and say like, okay, so where should we take it next? 
more or less. So this is version one. So as you can see, we're on Middle Natch Island. Um, and this is uh, this view that we have right here. Well, there's a map view. That first person view is you can just see a ortho photo drape over the island. This is with realistic elements. So you can kind of toggle on uh, 3D trees and vegetation. Unlike just the, the walking ground view thing, this one we allowed for a bit more of a drone view. Started looking at tides, uh, but also want to look at sea level rise scenarios. And we started adding abstract elements too. So that's the higher range of that sea level rise scenario. Also started adding maps, uh, things that people um, what might want to see that they're, they're doing or that's relevant to the current work. So that was a map of some Blackberry management areas that uh, they're currently exploring. So unlike the other visualizations, what we're kind of seeing now is there's a bit more of a mix of realistic and abstract elements. It's not just this idea of creating a real world space to just look like a real world space. And the final piece is uh, we're walking over to that I over there. That is, uh, I stands for information. Um, what we're experimenting with here is the incorporation of different media into the visualization tool. And as you can click it here, what it does is it opens the video. So you can use that as a another way of engaging folks and, and sharing some info. British Columbia, Canada. So that was version one. Now you're gonna, like after that, we engaged uh, this uh, this group of folks that um, have work and have relationships with the island, um, analyze the data, figure out one of the, the, the way that we wanted to take it or the way that it seemed that the group um, would be interested in taking an ex uh, sort of management scenarios they'd be interested in exploring centered on uh, Himalayan Blackberry management. And you're gonna see that version two here is actually quite a bit different from version one. So this is what happens after taking uh, in some of that feedback and making tweaks here. One of the first things you notice is that people were having challenges navigating the first one. So we now have a map that's always in display there, allows people to help them navigate through here. We're looking at different Blackberry management scenarios. So as you get closer to a space that you're supposed to interact with and look at these scenarios, a uh, pop-up comes up to indicate that um, this is uh, this is where you want to look at those scenarios. So it's a bit more of a guided experience. That's another thing that people suggested. And we're looking at these different sort of management scenarios through um, uh, right after treatment and later down out uh, later down out the, the road after one growing season. This was another suggestion. Can we add a time element to it, a temporal element? And some of the scenarios we looked at were things that they're interested in exploring, like prescribed burning. Um, and we also looked at uh, uh things like uh hand pulling and so forth so just doing a comparison of these these scenarios and uh just about to wrap up fairly shortly here so i just want to give you some um highlights some insights that came out of this uh the, for the first focus group there's a lot of rich discussion but just a couple of the points that came out were people were um interested in uh using this tool as highlighting different conservation areas, uh, using it for environmental management and conservation purposes. Some suggestions um, outside of the Blackberry management realm involved, uh, can we use it for looking at uh, glaucous wing gull nesting sites and um, where these uh, gulls might be. Also, people talked about it as using it as a tool for a possible tool for visitor experience and public education, knowing that Middle Natch Island is hard to get to. Um, so that uh, came out of that discussion too. Now, in the second version of it, um, the parks volunteers that engaged in our focus groups, they were very familiar with the island. And what they noted was that uh, they, they recommended this was used for public education. They said that it might not actually be that useful for their work and it actually maybe should be a public education tool, not just a suggestion, but more maybe that's what we should use it for. So that's kind of an interesting insight on the limitations of these tools. tools. They said that they're already kind of aware of the island um, they also commented on the vegetation and saying that the vegetation wasn't quite right. Um, and this is an important thing to note because previous research, uh, including mine, on visualizations and uh, uh, virtual environments, uh, research that does sense of, play, uh, sense of presence, um, notes that if you don't get vegetation right, people don't feel like they're immersed in the virtual environment. And then finally, um, uh, this is my, my final piece. I'm just gonna wrap up just giving you uh, some current work that we're, we're uh, doing right now. We're doing a very different project. This is in Revelstoke, uh, BC, in the interior of British Columbia. Um, what we're doing here is we're looking at different food system scenarios 
And um, we're doing this in a way that we want to look at it uh, with respect to food equity and food justice. So we're using an equity lens. We uh, finished our first set of workshops in December, which engaged in these terms around justice, equity, decolonization, and inclusion, um, asking folks what these terms mean to them, what they mean in the Revelstoke context, what they mean in, with respect to food systems in the Revelstoke context. Uh, part of the, the activity was uh, asked them to identify a worst food system ever. So not a desirable scenario or even one that people want to consider, but like an anti-scenario, something we want to avoid. And then the second stage that will happen in May is where we're going to start actually developing scenarios around a local food system strategy. So this could be something around perhaps maybe developing an urban farm, uh, working with plans there. We haven't fully defined it yet, but we're going to look at different configurations of space um, and different ways of doing this strategy that might be both uh, beneficial and have trade-offs and might be useful and, and also look at in terms of who do they benefit, which groups are experienced the trade-offs. So using that social justice and equity lens. And finally, we're going to create a visualization. We're starting to work on it, and this visualization will be able to be used at multiple scales. So we'll look at it site specific, uh, how the scenarios look at the site, like you've seen in those previous, um, well, the previous visualizations, but also in terms of what it means for this local food asset with respect to where it fits within the broader community, where it is with the, respect to commercial, residential uh, pathways, and so forth. So um, I am just right at the end of it. This is my website. If people want to learn a little bit more about my work, I do more than just visualization stuff, but it's a, it's a part of what I do. Uh, I'd be happy to connect with people after this uh, this presentation as well, too. Um, my apologies. I actually went on longer than I expected, but uh, thank you very much for attending. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rob. That was a wonderful presentation, jam-packed with some interesting insight and some great ideas. I'm uh, quite inspired. To respect everyone's time, I want to, um, again, thank Rob and turn it over to some questions briefly, either through chat or you just raise your hand and unmute yourself. Any questions? Oh, we've got one. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Warren. Uh, hi, um, I have quite a few questions. So if somebody else wants to go before me who just has one question, then I, I think I'll wait. Is that okay or? Yeah, that's, an, that's, that's a great offer. Edward, you wanna take him up on that offer? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, first off, thank you for passing the buck like that. I appreciate that. Um, Super, super, super specific and, and focused question. I found it really funny, uh, the 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 comment about how uh, being able to see underwater helped people appreciate like underwater ecosystems. Mm. Um, and I'm really curious about its application in the context of things like salmon conservation and visualization of <clears throat> kind of making more concrete these different scenarios, because this is a ridiculously powerful tool um, like different conservation scenarios with regards to uh, um, impacts of uh, rolling back maybe a certain scenario. Let me phrase this better. Different scenarios with regards to salmon conservation in the context of uh, adjustments that are made to fisheries management um, with regards to, say, uh, hatcheries. Um, and just like leaving it the heck alone. So kind of just like having that spectrum um, because I think that might be of utility. And I was just curious if you had any uh, feedback or, or thought about that. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a it's a, a fantastic point because yeah, you know, often we look at the, the baseline scenario as just kind of the starting point, where do we go from here? But you can actually do that. Uh, and there are definitely elements of uh, some of the future scenarios where we talked about, um, uh, well, what areas are we just not touching in the same sort of like exactly what you're talking about. Um, now, the uh, one of the, the interesting things about it, and, um, you know, not to deviate too much from the, the question, uh, but, you know, people saw the eelgrass meadows, but uh, part of it was also making sure that um, you have other elements to show that uh, there is some interactions of the eelgrass meadows. So the, those Dungeness crabs were in there, and you can kind of make that uh, the unseen scene. So I think you can actually, uh, there, there would have like, you know, application with um, other wildlife, including salmon. But um, I mean, going back to the question itself, uh, one of the things that came up in the Squamish discussion, uh, even though it wasn't necessarily featured or the, uh, uh, the, the spots that I spotlighted um, in the visualization itself, people did talk about that. Like, can we talk about 
what's not developed in some of these scenarios. And that was actually uh, part of the, some of the sort of richer storylines. And you see it more on the, the larger maps. Um, you also kind of see a big trade-off in that low density where say like, hey, if we walk through here, it means that we get to retain most of our space. And you know, that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff doesn't get developed, but then you look at the larger map and you kind of see what is needed in terms of sprawl to be able to accommodate that, that new population, right? So. So yeah, definitely um, a lot of ways, like the things that don't change were also as featured uh, as the things that do change. So yeah, definitely uh, a strong point and it came up in our discussions in the focus groups. And and just one really quick addendum to that. Uh, has this potentially been used in the context of uh, like urban, uh, like creeks and reestablishment of uh, uh, like waterways in urban environments uh, for salmon? And I'll end there. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, less about the 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 urban, um, but uh, the the first study that I was uh, showing that was uh, Mount 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 Chiem, uh, the, there was forestry management scenarios, but they also had riparian management scenarios too. So that was part of it. Uh, and then there's um, I've definitely seen other visualization studies, like more recent ones that were using uh, sophisticated elements of being able to plot different landscape elements uh, with and looking at it specifically in terms of adding more green infrastructure. So yeah, those pieces are certainly there. And um, but long story short is that there is a very clear application for that. Yeah. Great question, Edward. Right. Thanks so much. And, and thanks for the answer, Rob. Uh, just to respect everyone's time, if you need to go, feel free. Thank you very much for joining us for the, the full hour. And we will stick on for a few minutes longer just to uh, answer these last questions. Now, Farhan, you had uh, some questions you patiently waited for, Edward. Would you like to go next or let Leslie go? Uh, go ahead, Leslie. Um, I think mine's pretty quick. I'm interested to know who contracted you contracted you to do the work in Revelstoke. And I'm also interested to know uh, what the cost to the municipality of Squamish was for the work that you did. I'm a city councillor in Nelson. Oh, okay. So th this is uh, um, one of my favorite questions to answer because the the, the cost is actually not um, anything in terms of cash costs. So, uh, and it's, it's generally it's me uh, approaching the folks to um, uh, see if there's uh, interest in doing a research project. So I'm funded through public funds. Uh, my real cost and ask is uh, actually more, can we get folks to show up to the table uh, and uh, have discussions on it to make sure that this is a community-based research project, right? Um, and also the other ask is really, can we make this stuff open access afterwards? So you can download that those visualization tools. We have to discuss a little bit about uh, sensitive data and so forth. But um, in the case of Squamish, it was me approaching uh, the community of Squamish. Uh, um, also approached another uh, couple communities, but Squamish seemed to have the most interest and uh, need at the time. Uh, and similar, um, Revelstoke, it was actually uh, through um, a relationship with the Public Health Association BC. They know that they were looking at food systems issues and were working with the community uh, uh, Revelstoke Connection Society or Community Connections Revelstoke Society, um, who is actually a, a project partner there too. So we're, um, uh, so we're, we're actually, the idea is really just uh, see where the interest is and if we can establish those relationships uh, and be able to co-develop it together, yeah. Awesome. Just one last piece, and then I'll I'll pass it back. But we are at the very beginning of our official our official community plan update, and we definitely want to um, inspire more youth to participate in that. So this, to me, looks like a tool that would do that. So I'm very interested to talk more about it. Yeah, please, please get in touch with me afterwards. Um, I You can contact me through that website. Uh, definitely my email is on there. Um, I'm actually just happy to throw in the chat, too. You know what? I'm just going to do that. Um, and while, while that's happening, I can do two things and somebody else can uh, ask, ask some questions, but I'd love to set up a chat. That'd be great. Great, Leslie. Thanks for joining us and great questions. Brian, go ahead. Hey, thank you. Uh, so first of all, I'm, I'm really happy that, that this talk happened because um, I've recently started engaging with the Rotary Club and we're doing some project ideation. Um, around um, carbon footprint and, and kind of climate change and all. And so uh, one of the ideas that I was thinking about was kind of along similar lines. So it was, it was really good timing that this came up and thanks to Robin that she shared the talk. So my first question is specifically about the, the systems modeling. So mm -hmm. I see that there's quite a lot of variables and the way I look at it is that you 
probably have a, a framework then that that uh, takes all these variables and then all these parameters and kind of maps it to the to the visual environment and then unity engine does the 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 graphics part of it um, um and so you build it on top of it so the first question is like in that system is there any um uh, parameters for for let's say population health or like carbon footprint from uh, the different additions to 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 the system Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, so the those elements were um, defined by through our discussion through the, the workshop. So um, now the, the way it worked was that I wasn't really asking people necessarily for indicators right off the bat because that's like a pretty big ask. So instead, uh, we're just asking for the things that they're interested in preserving, you know, uh, community health, um, access to green space and so forth. And then it was up to me and the, the uh, collaborator working with and some other folks that might have some insight on it uh, to come up with the indicators through the literature, common indicators um, that, uh, that would be used as ways of uh, assessing whether you're making progress or what the possible outcomes would be in this area. So yeah, there, um, uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from uh, vehicle traffic, we did some estimates around that. Health would be around looking at how much this would encourage walkability based on like current walking stats uh, and you know work walking curves to to work and that sort of thing, right? Um, access to green space is you know is indicative of uh, you know people having um, resources that can or like uh, local assets that can help with mental health. So that's sort of how it worked, right? We um, first come up with the things that they're looking at, uh, what they want for outcomes, uh, and then afterwards uh, we kind of figure out what's the sort of data needs that we need to do there. In current work and actually future work doing the system stuff, we're now using semi-quantitative modeling, uh, which is quite exciting. Uh, basically, you create the systems model um, and you don't use real data. Instead, you uh, get a lot of opinions or, or uh, professional knowledge, probably an expertise, to identify the strengths of the relationships. So afterwards, uh, what you're doing is systems dynamics that kind of show that relatively this scenario would be better for this area, um, but maybe not as good for this area. And what's exciting about that is then you can start bringing in elements that are hard to find indicators and data for. And that's sort of a, as currently what we're working with in a, with a, a project up in the Comox Valley. And we're hoping to use that tool for um, both Revelstoke and, and future work too. Well, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, so, so I'm. Uh, you mentioned something that that the tools are kind of available open source. Like, if let's say I had some 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 data that I just wanted to like play around with, and like I'm okay with like I'm I work in software, so I'm okay to use like a framework like get it from open source. Is there are those available online or uh, on the lab website or something? Yeah, I mean, well, you can download the examples that are on there. There is like a kind of a prepared uh, uh, packaged application, though. So just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so there's there's not much. You, you can't really necessarily do tweaks in the actual um, Squamish visualization. It is sort of, it is what it is. Um, yeah. And the same thing with the model explorer. It's just a way of communicating out those uh, those pieces. Um, I do actually have all like my ArcGIS and R scripts on there too, if uh, if that's of interest. But mm -hmm. maybe what we might want to follow up on is that we are... Um, uh, looking at different applications, uh, particularly that semi-quantitative systems modeling, right? And um, that if that's of interest too, that one is actually more flexible, where you can uh, put in your own nodes and uh, systems elements. Yeah. Um, the Unity uh, gaming engine, um, there's a lot of like uh, of lit or uh, things that are written on how to do it. Um, and Unity is actually a free program if you're not trying to make money off video games. Mm -hmm. So certainly there are ways of being able to adapt that process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you, you're right. The semi Semi systems is is that what? Uh, semi quantitative, yeah. Semi quantitative systems, yeah. I think that that is probably what uh, is uh, kind of what I was thinking of. Yeah, you're right because the visualization is then very specific to that application uh, in the end, right? Uh, but 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 uh, so 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 let's say sorry, I'm taking so long. So <laughs> please stop me. So how how much work is it like if if let's say we you you want to model. Um, a couple of parameters in a new locality, like how much time and, and kind of human effort it takes. And then uh, I guess the cost came up already, um, but um, uh, uh, from, from what I understand, you, this is done as a research project under grants. So like mm -hmm. if, if people kind of uh, apply together to a grant or, or something like that, but at that, for the end user, there isn't like a, much of a cost, is, is that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's um, 
the the way that uh, in this particular case, like or like all the the research that I've done, it has been uh, supported by grants, and we will look at like collaborative grants. So mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of the cost, it's it's an interesting question because after the um, the first visualization I did, uh, that often comes up. People say like, well, you know, is this like super expensive to do? Um, mm -hmm. You know, is this uh, is it worth the time that's put in there? Now, um, my response to that was that a lot of the time was actually me figuring out the process, the best process for doing this. And now that I've got a like a nice workflow for it, it's mm -hmm. not as expensive as, as you might want to might think initially, right? So mm -hmm. for the Squamish visualization, um, I ended up uh, getting a relatively small grant that was uh, about twenty five thousand. It's called a partnership engage grant. You work with a, a, a partner, a non academic partner, and um, uses uh, you can use it to support the uh, the development of it i got two students that didn't really have any experience with the software except for uh, a little bit with arcgis and a bit uh, photoshop but none on the the gaming engine side trained them up and uh they did the vast majority of it, the building right so i was more just directing and guiding so so that uh, that was over a three month period so ultimately we're not it's not super time consuming i guess i mean it's it's a bit of time but uh you know i think a lot of people have this uh, this idea that it takes much longer and the uh the expense is much higher i see okay so uh, th then like coming to the food system um, systems visualization one so there is there is some very fundamental um uh issues that that have been researched through the for the food system and i think there's a lot there is a lot of um um kind of research on on the quantitative analysis of like how this works and how much how much food waste we see through the through the whole um, uh, supply chain like i think guelph ontario did a smart cities um, uh, um grant that they got from from infrastructure canada to to look at the food flow um and so those have mostly been uh analyzing all of that data and then like taking decisions based on that and in this case i i didn't didn't quite capture the 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 objective of the project is it to kind of visualize how the city looks if we change the system or is it like how like what is the visualization aspect of it and what is the quantitative aspect of it sure yeah so in this one um it actually this this one or we're likely going to use the semi-quantitative approach we might experiment with that um but like more than anything we're, we're probably going to be doing more of a soft systems approach so this will be uh much more qualitative in nature right so we're kind of experimenting with uh, the whole range of how, how to be able to analyze uh scenarios right um the, the person i work with uh colin dring has a lot of experience in um doing stuff around food justice work and equity and so forth right um uh, uh this is uh, the jedi uh, term je um, justice, equity, decolonization, and inclusion. So um, the idea here was to kind of initially start with this foundation of like, let's get used to these principles, right? And then we're going to look at uh, possible um, scenarios. And this is still, um, because we're working with in collaboration with uh, the community, we still haven't actually firmed up exactly what we want to uh, look at in, in terms of the scenarios. But one example that's come up was that there is a, a site that is being considered um for uh, a community farm right and then what would this community farm look like is actually a fairly large site so it could also have other elements like green space uh trail networks it can kind of link into the community in other ways right and we could look at different con landscape configurations and even different ways that uh the farm plot is set up uh just itself right and then talk a little bit about the location of this and also the configuration of this does this from uh benefit some more than others right is there um uh issues maybe even around like things like access uh is there issues around um perhaps uh, the types of like crops that are there really getting uh trying to get people to think um you know outside of the their their comfort zone or like i guess outside of the the confines that they're usually thinking in right and then uh the visualization itself will probably have um, a bit more in the way of like uh, pop-ups, like sort of like we saw with the second version Middle Natch Island. So as you're going through the scenario, uh, you can look at the different pieces, but then also have uh, information that might come up as you come to different elements, aspects of the scenario to show that, say like, 
hey, you might actually like this, but just, uh, let, you know, just to give you some information on it through our sort of SOS systems analysis or examination of it, you can kind of think that this might be beneficial for some, but less so for others. And then when you look at the regional approach, then you start seeing where these things are positioned. Are they like located next to certain neighborhoods, next to certain businesses? Um, are there easier routes for some over others? So that's the like that's an example, but we haven't actually fully um, firmed up exactly what they want to explore as a community. Yeah, I see. I understood. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. I, I come from a purely kind of like software and hardware background. And so I'm recently getting into like work that's uh, sustainability and equity yeah. and e equality. And so really, thank you so much. It, today was so enjoyable. Thank oh, you. great. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. You, you might have uh, got a sense of it. I started off as uh, my first degree, biology and statistics, then mm -hmm. environmental management on the social science side. And then I went into geography because I'm kind of all over the place and I don't really know where I fit. Um, <laughs> but we do experiment with a lot of different methods and different sort of techniques. And uh, um, that's part of it, just kind of seeing what resonates and what actually lands with people but I'd be happy to continue the conversation um, cool. and uh, connect at a, a later date if you want to chat cool. more I would love to connect thank Great. you Bye. thank you for being so generous with your time Rob I really really appreciate it